Hi, I'm Ben Sykes, I'm an Associate Professor in Equine Internal Medicine. This is Wagga, we're coming from Sydney, Australia today to talk to you about equine gastric ulcer syndrome in horses. So when we talk about ulcers, it's really important to recognise that we're not just talking about one disease. The horse's stomach has two quite distinct linings to it. The top part of the lining is the squamous mucosa, and that's the same as our skin or our esophagus. And we've known about disease in the squamous mucosa for about 20 years, and it's very well recognised. And if you go onto Google and have a look, most of what you're going to see is going to be about the squamous mucosa. But we've all, in the last five years or so, we've really started to recognise that the bottom half of the stomach, particularly deep in the stomach at the glandular mucosa where it empties into the small intestine, we see a lot of lesions there. And the horses that we see lesions in the top half and the bottom half are different types of horses. So we might see one lot in high performance sport horses, we see other in riding horses and stuff like that. Horses like Wagga here. So it's really important that we make that distinction because when we think about the sort of clinical signs, the sorts of horses that are affected, when we think about treatment, and then when we think about how do we stop ulcers occurring in the first place and prevention strategies, it's really important that we're targeting both the squamous, which we know a lot about, and the glandular, which we're increasingly knowing more about as we do more and more research into it. When we talk about clinical signs, there's a couple of things that are really important to recognise. The first is, is what we see in individual horses can vary a lot from what we sort of see in a population. So we talk about clinical signs that we might see in a you know, population level, but then we recognise that each individual horse is an individual and we're going to see them show the expression of pain associated with gastric ulcers in slightly different ways. We also recognise that there's probably some subtle differences between what we see for squamous disease and glandular disease. So for squamous disease, what we tend to see is problems associated with eating, maybe slow eating, maybe changes in eating behaviour, or maybe just unexplained weight loss where the horse is perhaps not consuming as much hay or pasture as it would in between its normal hard feeds and stuff like that. When we look at glandular disease, we tend to see things more associated with the behaviour of the horse and particularly the rideability of the, of the horse in horses like Wagga here. So we'll find them sort of particularly changes in behaviour. So a horse that's always been calm suddenly becomes resistant to move or resistant to work on these sorts of things. For diagnosis, we have a few options. The main way we diagnose gastric ulcers in the horse is with gastroscopy. So looking down into the horse's stomach with a camera. And that's really useful because it, it lets us grade the severity of the lesions, how big they are, how extensive they are. And it also lets us separate out the squamous lesions from the glandular lesions. And when we talk about treatment prevention, that's really important to know exactly what we're dealing with. When we can't do gastroscopy, we do sometimes just treat and see what happens. And that can be quite useful as well in, in certain circumstances. And then there's a range of other diagnostics that are used. Although, you know, for me, those two are the way that we, you know, the most reliable techniques that we have. For treatment, our cornerstone treatments are meprazole. It's an acid suppressive drug and by removing the acid, we allow the ulcers to heal. And that's something that I personally have done a lot of work on research-wise over the last few years, so it's a particular interest of mine. But it is important that we distinguish the squamous and glandular disease because squamous disease responds fairly well to just acid suppression, but when we have glandular disease, we have other treatment modalities we need to use as well. So that distinction can be quite important because if we just acid suppress those horses, we don't always get the outcome we want, then if we use more combined combination therapy, with a range of different approaches at the same time. The other thing that's really important during our treatment is that we address the risk factors and the reasons why the ulcers may have occurred in the first place. I'm going to talk about that more in a second. So it's one thing to treat our ulcers, it's another thing to make sure they don't come back. And as we just said, part of our treatment is to start changing management factors that may have contributed to the development of disease in the first place. And again, it's really important that we separate squamous from glandular disease here. For squamous disease, it's about feeding and it's about how hard we exercise our horses. So for feeding, it's really important that we have a high roughage intake and ideally have ad libitum access to roughage. We can supplement that with feeding additional roughage before peak uh, stress times or peak times of acid injury, which is during exercise. So feeding a flake of lucerne hay before exercise is one of the strategies that we'll recommend in horses that have an ongoing problem. In addition to having lots of roughage in their diet, we want to minimise the amount of carbohydrate in their diet. So it doesn't mean we can't feed concentrate feeds, it just means we need to be conscious of the amount of carbohydrate in the con concentrate feed, and we need to be focusing, particularly in our sport horse population like this, using low carbohydrate, high fat feeds are really sort of well suited to, the, to gastric health. The next thing we want to think about, and that's really focused on squamous disease. The next thing we want to think about is if we start thinking about glandular disease, is that we start thinking about um, the role of exercise particularly. There's a role of exercise in squamous disease. And so for squamous disease, it's how long we exercise for. So how long we exercise total in any given week. Because as we exercise, we squeeze acid up and that splashes on the squamous mucosa and causes disease. 
So if we can do high intensity, short interval workouts, that's gonna reduce our risk of squamous disease over say and have long warm up, long cool down periods, which for the stomach's point of view is actually quite, quite deleterious. When we think about glandular disease, it's a different relationship with exercise. So what we're looking at from glandular disease, it's the number of days you exercise per week, which is the risk factor. And so for horses, particularly our riding horses like this, that are maybe more predisposed to glandular disease, we recommend to make sure they've got at least two to three rest days a week where all they do is just hang out and be horses. And ideally, outside of competition, we try to recommend that they get ridden one day on, one day off. Recognising that that's for the stomach, there's more to a horse than just the stomach, so we've got to balance that sort of thing in. The last thing that we build in, for years we've talked about stress um, being a cause of ulcers. Stress really doesn't play a role in squamous disease. It's, it's a much more direct relationship between diet and exercise and intensity of management. But we've got a fairly strong body of evidence that's growing to say that stress is an important role in glandular disease. So environmental optimization is really important. Letting these horses get out, get out and about, letting these horses be horses, cohabitating them with other horses, these sorts of things. Letting them express their normal grooming behavior, these sorts of things. And then focusing on other potential areas of stresses, you know, too many handlers, too many riders, these sorts of things we've identified as risk factors. And then making sure we don't have concurrent disease like saddle soreness or lameness issues that we need to deal with as well. The last leg of our prevention strategy is thinking about what role we have for other additional things like supplements and nutraceuticals and these sorts of things. And they play a very useful role in conjunction with all of the other things that we've talked about there. Uh, I think it's important when you talk about nutraceuticals that you really focus on a couple of things in the nutraceutical selection. There are a lot of products out there with a lot of claims that are completely unsubstantiated. So you want to look for products that have substantiated scientific claims. You want to look for products that have published literature that support their use. The other thing is, is that we know that in that industry, there's a really wide range of quality control processes in the manufacturing. So you need to make sure that you're selecting products that are going through a rigorous quality control process during their manufacturing. And there are international standards that are used for that, and these are the sorts of things that you should be looking for.